If there is one thing I've learned in my life, it's the importance of the people you surround yourself with. And maybe you know by now, Maria Shriver is one of the friends I hold so dear to my heart. She is my go-to at any time I'm in a crossroads or in a funk. One call to her and suddenly my mental load feels lighter. But this Maria you're about to hear from is not like the Maria you met in the past. We go deep. She is candidly reflecting on topics we haven't heard from her on everything from growing up a Kennedy to navigating life after divorce. And guys, she's just so full of wisdom. Once you're touched by Maria's insight, you'll never look at life quite the same way. For everyone who's listening, I get a pen and paper ready because I feel like you do this thing where you drop all these little wisdom bombs. <laughs> just today, you said something about I was explaining to you how sometimes people poke me in a way that is painful, mm -hmm. whether it's somebody who I knew a long time ago or somebody who I work with or whatever. I said, when this is actually a teacher who taught me, he said to me, think of that person as your teacher. They are actually bringing up something in you that needs to be resolved. Yeah. They are teaching you how to handle whatever comes up in your interaction with that person. And uh, he was saying, instead of being irritated by this person. that person, look at them as your teacher and try to understand what's happening in you. In you. In you, because it's always about mm -hmm. what you're supposed to get and how you can heal whatever is going on in you because it needs to be healed. It's everything that I've learned in yeah. this journey of life is that, which I wish I had known actually so much younger, is that everybody is coming through as a teacher. And that if you could look at them <clears throat> that way, yeah. it actually demystifies them in some way. It takes away some of the irritation yeah. about them. And this person came to teach me about my pain. Yeah. This person came to teach me about strength yeah. that I didn't know I had. Yeah. And I think one of the cool things about you is you are a learner and a teacher. You just recently talked to the coach from Duke. Right. For your show. For our show. All right. Here we go. Let's go. Motion. Head coach Kara Lawson is changing the game. Hit the guard on the tight court. Not just for her players and the Duke women's basketball team. <laughs> Good. Good. But for everyone, thanks to her message captured during a team practice earlier this year and posted on social media that went viral. We wait for stuff to get easier. It will never get easier. What happens is you handle hard better. So that's a mental shift that has to occur in each of your brains. It has to. Because if you go around waiting for stuff to get easier in life, it's never going to happen. What did you learn about life from, from her? First of all, I think we all need coaches yeah. in some way, right? It's not just the person who's on the basketball team or the football team. And I always looked at coaches on those young people and thought, yeah. God, I wish I had that now at this age, yeah. somebody coaching me yeah. forward, right? She said, you know, I was focused on only 17 people. And it went to tens of millions of people. Jeez. And she said, I think people focus a lot of the time on, like, I have to impact the oh. world. And just focus on the one, five, 17 people you want to focus on and then leave the rest kind of up to God. I always yeah, say up God. to God. Yeah. Coach Lawson said, you know, I'm here to remind people that they have done hard things mm. and they can do more hard things. Mm. And what I took away from that was, like, yeah, I, I've actually done hard things. I don't give myself credit for the hard things that I've already done, yeah. which then encourages me or inspires me. Yeah, I can do more hard things because yeah. I've done them. I've done I that. forget about them. Yeah. And I took that away that we're capable of doing hard things in uh -huh. our future because we've done them to get to where we are. Right. Look at us sitting here. And I like that. Like, don't go wide, go deep. Yeah, she's like, I wasn't talking to anybody she else. I, she said, because I took her, her yeah. speech and put it up on my Instagram. And she goes, I for sure wasn't talking to Maria Shriver. Isn't that interesting? But I ended up talking to her. And you, I was like, that is so wise. Just focus on 
the kid that's in front of you, mm-hmm. the friend that's in front of mm-hmm. you. I did not grow up with that message. Mm-hmm. And I have found in my life that what fills me up, what yeah. makes me feel good, is not what I thought when I was 20 or 30. Mm-hmm. It's the, I'm talking to you, mm-hmm. somebody's talking to me. Uh, and that's kind of, I think, a secret that people don't talk about enough. When did you start on this journey of like figuring out who you were? Because I, I would imagine with, with all your kids and your life, you were just getting through. That's a good, I've actually thought a lot about, and I don't, I'm on a continual quest actually yeah. to um, learn about myself, why I'm here, and how um, I'm moving through the world and its effect on my small world, mm-hmm. right? And so I've often thought about, was I always curious? And the answer is yes, yeah. I was always curious, which is why journalism was so great for me. I think um, I've had a couple big pillar moments. I think when my dad lost, he was the vice presidential nominee on the McGovern ticket, and that was a huge, hard lesson about politics for me. Which it was, was, well, it was, you know, that it was for me loss, grief, it was assassinations. It kind of confirmed for me, like, oh, I don't want anything to do with this. It's not real, it's mm-hmm. not honest, it's not what. It pretends to be. And the journalism lesson was, you know, that I could put my whole heart and soul, I could work seven days a week, 24 hours a day, and they could decide on a whim it was over and Mm. I'm out the door, right? And certainly the, um, I I wanted uh, to have a different kind of marriage than my parents had. I wanted to have a different kind of life than my parents did. And the ending of all of that definitely sent me on a journey to reevaluate everything in my life, every aspect of my life, and um, how I had gotten where I was, what was my role in it, uh, what could I do better, um, what had I done that put me in that place. Um, I looked at my religion. I looked at the judgments of my religion. I looked at my own judgments. I looked at Uh, myself as a woman. I looked at um, everything. And I did everything that was available uh, that I could find to heal myself. And I still look at myself as on a healing Mm. journey. Mm -hmm. I think I just kind of have tried to dig deep and to understand that how I work in the world has a lot to do with how I feel about myself. Mm. And I didn't connect those two things. I was raised with just go out and try to work on the world and don't worry if you're upset or angry or resentment or any of these things. And then to actually turn that journey onto myself and into myself and then connect it to how how I Uh go out in the world has been a glorious uh, journey for me. I remember once you were talking to me and you said you were trying to separate what you believed mm. as and and wondering like what you believed inside or what things your parents put in you when you were yeah. a kid you know parents put things in us when we were a kid and we say i always believe x so you were discovering i still remember you were combing through stuff in your life like what do i actually believe and what stuff was taught to me so much and drummed into me that that became part of my dna how did you break through all that stuff. I think, you know, we all at some point go through that, yeah. right? We all wonder, like, is this my opinion or is this my parents' opinion? Or is this, you know, just something I heard and adapted? Or yeah. And I, I think that's a gradual process. You know, I grew up in this big Democratic family, and I was taught to believe that people who were Republicans, mm-hmm. well, you know, were the enemy. Mm-hmm. And then I fell in love with a Republican. Mm-hmm. And I was like, what? Whoa, 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 you know, and then everybody in my family is like, ah. <laughs> I could see people in my family having judgments about, you know, the person that I was choosing hadn't gone to the same kind of schools that people yeah. I grew up with and wasn't the same political party and wasn't this and wasn't that. And then I started wondering about judgments. Yeah. I started thinking about, gosh, we all judge people that are different from us. So that I began kind of thinking about that. Then I moved to Los Angeles and my family was like, oh my God, you would have thought I had, you know, I don't know what I had done. You know, my mother was like, you know, you're in Hollywood and that's Mm. terrible. Mm -hmm. And that's all. And I was like, is it? I don't know. You know? And so I think that 
Um, you know, I feel blessed to have had, obviously, the parents that sure. I had, but they're very different than me, and I have some similarities to both of them. Mm -hmm. But I have tried to pick apart, and I wanted to be, as I said, a different kind of mother, mm -hmm. a different kind of wife. And I've only, in my adulthood, tried to kind of be a different kind of woman. And I realized I thought I was so much like my mother in yeah. so many ways, and now I'm looking at things like, I'm like my mother, but I'm very different from my mother. How are you the same? I think we're both restless. Yeah. I think we're both um, determined. Yeah. She came up very much in a man's world. Mm -hmm. And when I was starting out, certainly in journalism, it was very much of a mm -hmm. male profession. So I, I adapted this like, okay, you know, yeah. fight. Right. And I remember a guy I was working with, it was a teacher, and he said, what are you fighting? Hmm. And I was like, what do you mean? I'm, yeah. I'm fighting. And yeah. he's like, what? And I was like, uh. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I was like, I don't know. Yeah. And he's like, you ought to be thinking about what you're fighting. Yeah. Maybe that's old. And oh. you're bringing the fight, you know, yeah. to the room. And you've already won that fight. And it's old. Right. It's over. You're in the room now. And you're in the room. And so you don't have to do that anymore. Right. And no one had ever said to me. Wow. You know, like it's like my friend Martha Beck, I was like, I got to hurry up and do this. And she goes, where are you hurrying up to? Where are you rushing to? And I was like, I got to get this done. I get this. She goes, well, but why? And I was like, yeah. I, I, <laughs> if so, you really break it down. So I've actually tried to slow down because yeah. I'm a different person when I'm going slow. Yeah. You know, everybody's rushing and they have their face in their phone yep. and they're, you know, running through their life. And I did that, and I don't remember a lot of it because I was running through. And so now I try to go slower so mm. I can remember the conversations, I can remember the moments, uh -huh. I can remember the people. Right. Okay, you tell me how you're, how you're the same as your mom. How are you different? I'm not as angry as my mom. Yeah. I don't have as much rage as my mom. Yeah. I've been able to delve into that in a way she couldn't. She wasn't given the opportunity or she didn't uh, know that it existed mm. there. So I have a very different spirituality. I think I have, uh, we're both, she was deeply religious um, and I think I'm deeply spiritual. I've been able to explore my femininity in ways I think my mother never could. Mm. I think I'm a more kind of uh, affectionate, physically affectionate mother. Mm than my mother was. Was it hard or awkward in the beginning if you didn't receive it to give it? or was No, because I knew that it. I didn't receive it and I needed to give it. You needed to, yeah. Because I, I, it was a big thing for me not to get it. Yeah. And, uh, and I think my, I also say that my mother was n probably not the recipient of it either. Yeah. And that we talked about breaking cycles in our families. And that's a cycle I wanted to break. How was your mom with your kids? Uh, very different yeah. uh, uh, than she was with the five of us. I have yeah. four brothers and myself. And so she was able to take more time. I think my mother was in a real rush. Mm -hmm. When I was little, her brother was president. She was trying to build a worldwide organization. Mm -hmm. She was trying to change the world. And I think that's really hard to push up against that 24-7. Yes and, you know, bounce the ball. Yeah. Yeah, it's really hard. And I always said to myself, I knew that my kids, you know, would end up in therapy at some <laughs> point, but I knew that they wouldn't be able to say she wasn't there. Mm -hmm. They could say she was this, this, or this, but I didn't want them to say that I had chosen something over them. I wanted them to know that they were my priority, and I wanted them to feel that. One thing that you're doing right now as we speak is we hear a lot about raising kids up and the right way to raise them up, but there's not a whole lot said about how to raise or continue to raise adult children. Right. I've seen people, when you were on the show, asking about that, mm. and it doesn't get a whole lot of attention. I know. I was just actually talking about that all the parenting books are you know, for five and under, yeah. or teenagers, and I think it's complicated with adult children, yeah. and I, I, I know people say like, you know, 18, out the door, yeah. 
cut them off, yeah. let them go. There's that philosophy. I, I've tried to kind of look at my home as a fueling station mm. where people can come back and get the love they need, the food yeah. they may need, the encouragement and nourishment that they may mm. need, and then to go out into the world and the truth. The and truth. the truth. You always tell yeah, them the, the truth. Yeah, the truth. You know, like the, the truth that they may not get someplace else. And I, I think I did not get a lot of talking yeah. when I was growing up. I think that's why I started writing books because I didn't, you know, there were things going on in my family that nobody talked about. And I think that was really detrimental because – You'd say, like, I would hear things in the zeitgeist, and yeah. I'd come home, and I'd go, is, is, is that true? true? Or is it, yeah. And, they're, you know, we don't talk about that. We don't talk about that. And, uh, or when, you know, my uncles were killed, we're like, we don't talk about that. We just move right along. And I'm like, yeah, but, like, right. somebody just, nope, let's go. Do you want to go sailing now? Do you want to talk about something else? And I'd be like, oh, okay. Uh, okay. So you buried it. So yeah. I buried it, and I buried it, and I buried it. And that, and whatever you bury comes out. And so I think understanding, learning about that um, helped me. And I think also wanting to talk and realizing I was in a family that was well-known that didn't talk about it. So where could I talk about yeah. it? Because I didn't want to talk about my family. So I masqueraded it in the books. Isn't that interesting? So I talked had to, to the world about about grief, about heaven, about intellectual disability, about Alzheimer's yeah. in my children's book or in my reporting so I could talk about what I couldn't talk about at wow. home. Wow. <laughs> that is fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> and then when did you start just saying, okay, well, I'm going to, I'm just telling the truth. Like that's how I'm going to go through life. I think I started feeling like I had the freedom or the permission uh. Uh, when my marriage ended. Hmm. I first, you know, felt like, oh, I better go and figure out, like, wh yeah. what is the truth? And I went to a convent uh, to, um, I did, like, so yeah. many things. But one <laughs> of the things I did is I went to a convent to be in silence and, you know, to look for advice. And the Reverend Mother there said to me at the very end, she said, I think you came here looking for permission. And I felt like I was in a scene out of The Sound of Music, you know, which had been like, I was like, I was like, oh, what? She goes, you can't come live here. And she goes, but you do have permission to go out and become Maria. And I was like, I was like sobbing. And I'm like, who's that? I was like, who is that? And so I think the word permission, I had never given myself permission to feel to be vulnerable, to be weak, to be brought to my knees. And the world did it to me. <laughs> and then I was like, okay, God, like, let's go. Yeah. And I'm going to take this and learn everything I can um, about my role mm -hmm. and what I need to learn. You know, when something like that or the universe knocks you like that, I think you have to like, not focus on the other person. Just figure out, like, what is your learning curve? What do you need to learn from this experience? And, um, and so I, I gave myself permission wow. to start learning. You talked about, I was asking you about raising up adult kids. Yeah, just about giving them a place yeah, to come place home, to come home and nurturing. To. Yeah, that that's what I feel that is my role. And I'm learning yeah. a role as a mama G. Yeah. How do I roll with my children's relationships? Mm -hmm. Do I... Give my opinion? Do I not? Do you? I do, <laughs> <laughs> okay. but I don't don't keep right. Giving give it, it once. I'm give maybe twice. Twice, <laughs> but you let yeah. them know. Yeah, I let them know. You know, and then I have to step out because it's not my life. Mm. And uh, watching your kids fall Oof. and and make mistakes and everything is um, painful. Mm -hmm. And that's the other thing I've learned actually that I wish somebody had told me What's very that? young is the and, joyful and painful. Mm -hmm. The greatest thing ever, and it's the most heartbreaking thing mm -hmm. ever. So it's a lot of and mm -hmm. holding both things mm -hmm. on any given day. Um, yes, the you know, and. So the That's and. good. That's yeah, good. not but, but and. If you're, you're listening and you haven't read Maria's Sunday paper, 
please read it. I look forward to it every Sunday morning. Aww. And the one, you've had so many brilliant ones, but there was one about when people feel invisible. Yeah. And that struck me. And it actually surprised me to hear you say that about yourself. Like I was reading that and I was, and you talking about when you're next to Arnold, sometimes people would reach across you as if you oh, weren't yeah. there to get to him. That's a big story of my life, actually, feeling invisible. I grew up feeling invisible in an incredibly public, famous family. So if you, as a child, are standing next to the President of the United States, two U.S. Senators, the First Lady, nobody's looking at you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you are background noise. And you take that with you really through life, and you end up putting yourself in situations where that continues mm. until you learn your lesson. Mm that it's not about other people seeing you. It's about you seeing yourself. And that took me a really long time, a really long time to learn. And so I would find myself getting angry at people, you know, who came up and didn't acknowledge that I existed um, <laughs> when I was standing next to Arnold or when I was standing next to, you know, my uncle or something. I'd be like, ah, and then I was like, they're teaching me a lesson, mm. that it's not about whether they see me. Do I see me? Am I visible to me? Mm. I thought what made people feel seen was winning an Emmy, yeah. getting an award, getting a book, being on TV. But what actually makes people feel seen and worthy is talking to them, sitting with them, calling them, slowing down. Right sitting on the porch going, I don't have anywhere to go. Oh my God. I'm right here with right you, here. Oh. and you are enough. It's funny because you're talking about relationships, parent, work, spouse, mm. all that stuff. You are doing these, these things are amazing. It's radically reframing. reframing. And right. now you're doing radically reframing relationships. relationships. Yeah. How do you radically reframe uh, relationships? relationships? Yeah, well, like I what? think they are, they are already being radically reframed. I mean, I like look what? at my kids in their 20s and 30s. Their marriages, their relationships or not marriages are so radically different than my mm -hmm. generation. How people get in and out of friendships. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, people in midlife understanding they need new friendships, delving out into friendships, understanding that friendships take work, and then also looking at the different kinds of relationships yeah. that exist that you need. It does take real work. It does, yeah. Are you expanding? Like, tell me about your friendship circle, or do you kind of get... <laughs> I'm not... No, I mean, I, you know, I, I wish... I, I feel like, you know, there was my college friends, my yeah. high school friends. And then, you know, when I had little kids, there were yeah. like all the, the mommies. Mom then all my kids left, right? Yeah. So then all of a sudden, kind of a lot of the school mommy friends Drift left off. too, right? right? They drifted off. And I found like at work, most of the people other than us are like yeah. 20. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, so I'm conscious of the fact that I want to make sure the friends I do have, mm -hmm. that I'm going deep. And the other thing that I feel like is so big with you is you're radically refra reframing aging. Yes, that's seminar. very important to me. Was Yeah, it was oh. so important, but yeah. Yeah, because we're all aging, right? Yeah. A lot of it is such a state of mind. But your mindset about who you are, what you're capable of, whether your best days are in front of you, that's so important to be able to think positively mm -hmm. about the aging experience. It's a blessing. It's a gift to keep mm -hmm. reminding yourself yeah. as opposed to getting looking in the mirror and going like, damn, who's that? Because we all have that critical of voice, course. right? And it's, it's never, or certainly mine has never been kind to me. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I have to catch myself all the time like, you're okay. Yeah, you, you know? got this. You got this. You're never going to be this young again. Yeah. So enjoy, enjoy it. it. <laughs> There's a person I see occasionally walking around, and she's always like, "Oh God, getting old's a pain." And that, and I don't like. I don't think that way. I mean, I just feel like well, you're so optimistic. You're so upbeat. Yeah. You're so positive. And so that's such a great thing to be around because that's contagious, and that makes you feel mm -hmm. also good about yourself, right? If you're around somebody, their energy, like we were talking the other night, walks into the room before they do. Yes. And you feel them coming in. Right. You feel and it. that's it's big. Yeah. Yeah. 
I love speaking to you. I love, Are we finished? <laughs> I don't want it to be. We made space. You made space. Maria, I love you. I love you, too. Thanks for coming to see me. Hey, thanks for watching. Don't miss the Today Show every weekday at 11 a.m. Eastern, 8 Pacific, on our streaming channel, Today All Day. To watch, head to today.com slash all day, or click the link right here.